A fetal pig dissection screencastify, made by Amanaz, Emily, and me, Sonia. The first pre-lab question asks for the complete taxonomy of a domestic pig. In figure one below, you will find the complete taxonomy of a domestic pig. The second pre-lab question asks for the gestation period of a fetal pig. The gestation of a fetal pig is three months, three weeks, and three days, or 114 days in total. Pre-lab question number three asks, what are the two unique external characteristics which distinguish mammals from all other vertebrates? One, all mammals have hair at some time during their development, and two, all female mammals possess mammary glands with external openings for nourishing the young. Pre-lab question number four asks, why fetal pigs are used for dissection? They are used for dissection because they have soft tissues at their premature age, which makes it easy to cut through. Also, the size of the organs make it easy to identify. And most importantly, they have similar internal anatomy to those of humans, and their organ structures are typical of mammals. The fifth pre-lab question asks about the role of pigs in xenotransplantation transplantation and the problems that arise. Since pig organs are similar in size and physiology to human organs, they are good candidates for transplant and would be readily available when needed. When pig organs are transplanted into humans, the immune system recognizes these molecules as non-self and begins to attack the pig tissue, leading to immediate rejection of the organ. In addition to these completely different molecules, because pigs and humans are genetically dissimilar, some of their proteins that serve similar functions have slight differences that also trigger an immune response. Unfortunately, not even the immunosuppressive drugs can control the rejection driven by tissue incompatibility between pigs and humans. The last pre-lab question asks for the differences of the internal anatomy from, from the pig and humans. In the digestive system, the colon and liver are different from that of humans. Pigs have a spiral colon, whereas humans have transverse, ascending, and descending colons. In a pig, the liver has five lobes instead of four in humans. In the circulatory system, the pigs do not have a common iliac artery, which humans have to supply the pelvic organs and legs with blood. In the respiratory system, pigs have four lobes in their right lung compared to three in humans, and their left lung has three lobes compared to two in humans. Observations can be displayed in table one, which are the quantitative observations of the fetal pig. I will start by discussing the respiratory system. The respiratory system is responsible for the process of respiration, which involves inspiration which is inhaling oxygen into the body to make available to each cell and expiration which is exhaling eliminating carbon dioxide waste. Figure 1.1 points towards the two openings, the nasal and oral cavity by which oxygen first enters the body. When you first inhale through your nose, your nasal cavity is responsible for keeping the air warm moisturized and filtered before entering the lungs. The oral cavity is a secondary external opening for the respiratory tract. Most normal breathing takes place through the nasal cavity, but the oral cavity can be used to supplement or replace the nasal cavity's functions when needed. Figure 1.2 looks at the epiglottis. The epiglottis is a flap that acts as a switch between the trachea and the esophagus. It is responsible for stopping food from entering the trachea to prevent choking. Figure 1.3 looks at the placement of the larynx and trachea within the body, and Figure 1.4 looks at the organs when removed. After the oxygen passes through the nose or mouth, passing the epiglottis, it enters the larynx. The larynx, also known as the voice box, is a short section of the airway that connects to the trachea. The larynx contains vocal cords. During normal breathing, muscular tissue holds the vocal cords apart, allowing air to pass freely through the larynx. After the oxygen passes through the larynx, it enters the trachea, also known as the windpipe. The rings of cartilage making up the trachea allow it to remain open to air at all times. The windpipe then connects to the bronchi, leading into the lungs. Figure 1.5 shows the anterior view of the lungs, and figure 1.6 shows the posterior. The lungs are a pair of large, spongy organs that gas exchange occurs in, between blood and air. In the pig, the lungs were protected by intercostal muscles which were cut through and pinned back to reach the lungs. In figure 1.5, you are able to see the trachea right above the lungs. The trachea is split into two pathways called the bronchus. Figure 1.8 shows the lungs when cut open. The left bronchus is clearly seen on the left lung. The bronchi are extended further into the lungs through bronchioles, seen on figure 1.8.
The main function of the bronchi and bronchioles is to carry air from the trachea into the lungs. Smooth muscle tissue in their walls helps to regulate airflow into the lungs. Figure 1.7 shows a closer look at the ends of the bronchioles, which carry alveoli. The alveoli are grape-like clusters found at the end of bronchioles and surrounded by capillaries. Air entering the alveoli allows to exchange its gases with the blood passing through the capillaries. The alveoli is where internal respiration occurs, the exchange of O2 and CO2 gases between the blood and tissue fluids. The oxygen transported from the bronchioles to the alveoli is then diffused into the blood in the capillaries and binds to hemoglobin and then is transported th throughout the body. Also, carbon dioxide brought from the capillaries to the alveoli is then exhaled. Shown in figure 1.9 is the diaphragm. This sheet of muscle is pulled back because it separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. The diaphragm is responsible for controlling the air pressure of the lungs. The digestive system starts with the oral cavity where the food enters. In figure 2.1, you see the mouth where the food first enters. Then mechanical digestion starts with the teeth pictured in figure 2.2. Once the food has been broken down by the teeth and digestive enzymes have been added to the food, it is a bolus. The digestive enzymes come from the saliva and the salivary glands, which are not pictured here because they are located in the head of the pig which was not dissected. After it is broken down, the tongue, which is also pictured in figure 2.1, pushes the food down the esophagus. Once the food has entered the esophagus, pictured in figure 2.3, it is pushed down to the stomach by peristalsis. The circular and longitudinal muscles in the esophagus contract to push the bolus down the esophagus involuntarily. Once it reaches the stomach, the cardiac sphincter, pictured in figure 2.4, expands to let the bolus enter into the stomach. Once it has entered the stomach, pictured in figure 2.5, chemical and me mechanical digestion begins. The stomach secretes gastric juices, which are made up mostly of hydrochloric acid and pepsin. These enzymes break up the food into smaller particles, and the pepsin specifically starts the digestion of protein. The mechanical digestion happens when the muscles of the stomach contract and release, breaking the food down into smaller pieces. The rugae in the stomach, pictured in figure 2.6, help to ensure that the food is broken down into smaller pieces by increasing the surface area of the stomach. Once the food has been broken down fully, the pyloric sphincter, pictured in figure 2.5, relaxes its muscles to allow the chyme to pass through into the small intestines. Once the food has entered the small intestines, pictured in figure 2.7 and 2.8, the muscles move the chyme through the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum using peristalsis. The villi and microvilli that line the inside of the small intestine absorb nutrients into the bloodstream through the blood vessels, and fat gets absorbed into the lymph vessels. The blood vessels carry the nutrients two cells in the body for energy. Once the chyme has passed through the small intestine, it enters the large intestine, pictured in figures 2.10 to 2.12. It moves through the colon by peristalsis to the rectum where it is eliminated by the body. While it is moving through the colon, water and vitamin K are being extracted and absorbed and traveling through the body. In figure 2.12, you can see the pig's colon has a spiral shape, whereas humans have an ascending, transverse, and descending colon. Along with all of the main organs in the digestive system, there are accessory organs as well. The liver, pictured in figure 2.13 and 2.14, is the organ responsible for the production of bile, which emulsifies fat for easier digestion. The excess bile is stored in the gallbladder, pictured in figure 2.15, under the liver. In figure 2.16, the pancreas is circled. The pancreas is responsible for producing many enzymes, such as pancreatic amylase, which breaks down starch and glycogen, pancreatic lipase, which breaks down lipids, pepsidases, which breaks down peptides, and chymotrypsin and trypsin, which breaks down small polypeptides. All these enzymes are made in the pancreas and added to the food at various points in the digestive tract. The final system in a fetal pig is the circulatory system. The main function of this system is to transport blood and nutrients throughout the body of the pig. The circulatory system of the pig consists of the heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries. There are two parts to this system. One is the pulmonary circulation of blood to the lungs, and the other is the systemic circulation of blood to the rest of the pig's body. Figure 3.1 displays the heart of the pig. The heart is the central part of the circulatory system, and it is primarily responsible for pumping blood and distributing oxygen and nutrients throughout the body. 
The organ is divided into several chambers that take in and distribute oxygen-poor or oxygen-rich blood. These chambers are accompanied by veins and arteries that facilitate the same function. The right atrium can be found on figure 3.1, and it is one of the four chambers of the heart. It is comprised of two atria and two ventricles. Blood enters the heart through the two atria and exits through the two ventricle. The oxygenated blood enters the right atrium through the inferior and superior vena cava. The left atrium is one of the four chambers of the heart located on the left posterior side. Its primary roles are to act as a holding chamber for blood returning from the lungs and to act as a pump to transport blood to other areas of the heart. The right ventricle is also seen in figure 3.1 and it pumps the blood up through the pulmonary valve and through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Next is the coronary artery. The coronary arteries supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. Lastly on figure 3.1 is the left ventricle. The left ventricle is one of the four chambers of the heart, and it is located to the bottom left portion of the heart below the left atrium, separated by the mitral valve. As the heart contracts, blood eventually flows back into the left atrium, and then through the mitral valve, where it en next enters the left ventricle. Figure 3.2 shows a cross section of the pig heart and is labeled with the corresponding label. The left pulmonary artery is responsible for transporting oxygen depleted blood away from the heart and back towards the lung. The main artery splits into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery, each of which directs the blood into the corresponding lung. The superior vena cava is a major vein in the pig's body. It carries blood from the head, neck, upper chest, and arms to the heart. The inferior vena cava is a large vein that carries deoxygenated blood from the lower body to the heart. The circulatory system is also comprised of three different types of blood vessels, which include arteries, capillaries, and veins. An artery is a blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart, where it branches into ever smaller vessels. Eventually, the smallest arteries, vessels, called arterioles, further branch into tiny capillaries, where nutrients and wastes are exchanged, and then combine with other vessels that exit capillaries to form venules. Small blood vessels that carry blood to a vein, a large blood vessel that returns blood to the heart. You can distinguish between the arteries and veins based on their coloring. Arteries carry oxygen-rich blood which make them gain their red coloring. Veins, however, carry deoxygenated blood, which is why they have a blue coloration. Pictured in figure 3.3 and 3.4 are the intercostal arteries and veins. They run on the coastal groove of each rib and supply the intercostal muscles with blood and drain away blood. In the comparison slide, figures 3.5 and 3.6 show how the branches of the aorta supply blood to various areas, including the stomach, which is labeled as the iliac artery, the small intestine, labeled as the cran cranial mesenteric artery, the kidney, which are renal arteries, the hind limbs, which are iliac arteries, and the placenta, which is labeled as the umbilical arteries. As well, branches of the caudal vena cava drain blood from the kidney, which are the renal veins, and from the posterior limbs, which are classified as common iliac veins.